Hello, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Courtney Drake and I am with Avalara. I'm glad to welcome you to today's presentation on Sales Tax Compliance 101. Now, before we dive into the, the specifics, the meat of the presentation, just a few friendly housekeeping reminders from me. First and foremost, as with all of our other webinars, we are recording today's presentation. So if you'd like to listen to it again or even share it with a colleague, you will receive a link to the recording in your email inboxes for the next 24 hours, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Next, let's do a quick review of this orange webinar console that we're looking at. Over on the left-hand side of your screen, there is a Q&A box directly underneath the video feed. I see a couple of you have already used that, but you can use that box at any point over the next hour to interact with myself or our speaker. We will be responding to questions individually as we can throughout the next hour. And then we also have some time set aside with our speaker at the end of the presentation for live Q&A. So be sure to stick around for that if you can. We also have some related resources and links available to you on the console if you're interested in learning more about any of the topics that we're discussing today. All of those links will open up in a new tab and we'll be waiting for you when the presentation for, is over. And that's also where you can download your own copy of today's presentation deck if you'd like to save it for later or just take a sneak peek at some of the things that we'll be discussing today. And new to the console, and actually I see many of you are already using it, we have reactions. So if you want to let us know what you're thinking, you'll see a little smiley face down at the bottom of the console and you can use that to pick from a few available emojis and let us know how you're feeling. Now, just a friendly reminder that we at Avalara are not legal tax advisors, so we can't provide tax advice. Everything that we discuss today is for educational purposes only, but we do our best to answer your questions as best that we can. And then Finally, a reminder that we are offering one hour of CPE credit for today's presentation. If you're interested in CPE, there are a couple of requirements for you to meet. First, you will need to respond to three out of four poll questions. Those poll questions will appear on your screen. They are only available on your screen for a limited amount of time. So make sure that you're ready to answer those questions when they appear. And then you must also attend today's session for at least 50 minutes, that's five zero minutes. And once you've met both of those requirements, you'll be available or you will be able to download your individual certificate in that earned certification box that's underneath the related resources. Your certificate will also be available in a post event email that we'll send out. All right, with that, let's do a quick introduction for our speaker today. Today, I'm happy to be working with Ronnie Fritz. He is one of Avalara's very first employees within our uh, First 10 employees. Today, he is a senior product solutions engineer. A lot of uh, wide, vast experience in sales tax and working directly with companies. So very happy, Ronnie, to have you here. Thanks for joining today. Thank you. All right, let's do a quick overview of what we're going to be discussing today. So we'll dive into first why sales tax matters, why it's such a big deal. Then we'll dive into some of the sales tax basics when you need to know if you have obligations in a state that's called nexus so we'll review that next we'll review the five steps to managing sales tax compliance and then we'll end up with tips to streamline sales tax management before we go into q a so with that i am going to let ronnie take it away in our first section of why sales tax matters thanks so much courtney and welcome everyone so this is going to be a fairly long discussion that we have here with lots of slides, so we're going to go through reasonably quickly. The first part of essentially why sales tax matters is because it matters to the states. And to understand that, just understand how much of the sales tax or how much the sales tax actually matters to the state with regard to the, the amount of tax that they're collecting overall for their, for their purposes, for whatever they're doing in their state, right? Sales tax is governed at the state level and each state sets its own sales tax rates and laws. And as well, the sellers collect the sales tax directly from the consumers then pass it through to the state. So from your perspective, you are the unfortunate bonded sales tax collector on behalf of your state so that they're relying on you for that sales tax revenue. The, the question is always asked as to how much does the state really rely on that sales tax revenue? 
And you can see here from this map essentially what the reliance is on the sales, just the sales tax amount with regard to the sales tax revenue that that state gets. So there's a couple of states, you can see them, there's a four states that are at 40% plus with their reliance on sales tax revenue. But most of them are in that 20 to 40% range, generally with regard to how much they rely on sales tax with respect to their overall funding. So it's a really critical piece for them. And it's really important that they do collect it because otherwise their services and everything else are going to be some in some way curtailed. We have our first um, poll question here, looks like. So you can answer that, please answer that. And we'll continue though, as you're doing that into the next slide. To discuss sort of the, the basics around what you're required to do is, is really fundamental in terms of what's needed to be known with regard to collection of the sales tax. So the three main components are where uh, the incident takes place. In other words, in other words, the sales tax transaction takes place. Is it the, the origin, the destination, the bill to? Like that's, that's something that needs to be known. Who is doing the buying? Who is doing the selling? Is that entity one or the other exempt in some manner or form? And then the what? Um, and unfortunately, the what is a super complicated discussion with regard to product taxability. But product taxability is very varied across the US and many products um, that you, and historically, this has always been sort of a split between physical products and services, but essentially you need to know what it is that's being sold because some products may not be taxable at all or some services may not be taxable at all. So let's talk about that. So most states tax some services, but a few of them ta tax almost all of them. So originally, and I, I'm thinking most of you know this, but originally, many years ago, it was all just personal property that was being taxed, physical goods, right? And in some cases, some, ta uh, some states taxed some services. And in some cases, some states taxed some software. So that has, over the number of years now, started to really shift because as more as more products, I'm going to say, are being able to be delivered as software or as software as a service, some of these new mechanisms for delivery of, of the services and the products that no longer require the vendor to be on site or on premise, the states have looked at this and they're actually, I mean, they're missing revenue in some cases. So they've started to develop new, way to, new ways to tax software and some services. And so this is a developing thing, which means that it's, it's false to rely on what you thought you knew about um, the taxation of services and software in the past, because it is changing dramatically in terms of what the state's requirements are as we move forward. The tax load in your state um, varies as well. As you can see most states are in that range of six to nine percent so the eight to nine percent you see in the bright red the seven to eight in the orange right and then six to seven in the lighter orange obviously there's a number of states that are the nomad states that have no tax whatsoever and there's a couple of them there's four of them there that are over nine percent with regard to the sales tax burden i'm going to say that's charged that is inclusive of any kind of local sales tax that might be applicable in those particular jurisdictions as well so it's important to get it right um, in terms of what you're charging and how you're charging it because the sales tax are reliant on it and it's a large number. Like it, it makes a difference on your clients' invoices. So what are your overall challenges and why this all matters is because this is a statutory requirement. Is you're required to, if you have Nexus, we're gonna get into the, you know, the what that means, but if you have Nexus, you're required to collect the sales tax. Those rates and those rules in the states, because the states are responsible for their own rules, they're in constant flux. They're constantly being changed. And, and that's something that's just as by virtue of the way that 
sales tax rates are decided and the products are decided. It's very political that essentially this is always something that's going to exist and they're always going to be changing. And from your perspective, all of this is a non-revenue generating activity. So like I said before, you are essentially a bonded sales tax collector on behalf of the state. So getting really good at this only means that you're getting really good at doing something for your state, right? So, and that means that the money that you spend on that activity, in, in essence, everything that you're spending towards doing this really well is not on your behalf. Like you're not, you're not generating extra revenue for the company at all. This is all to basically comply with the state regulations. So when do you have to collect sales tax? Like, and, and this discussion is essentially, when do you have nexus? So in, I'm gonna say it again in the past, sales tax nexus is, I mean, simply specified or, or defined as the requirement to, to uh, collect sales tax because you had a physical presence. But what does that mean? It means you essentially you have a level of connection between the taxing jurisdiction, in other words, the state and your business. And until this connection is established, the taxing jurisdiction can't impose its sales taxes on you, right? It's how that's being imposed that has really changed over time. So the standard, I'm going to say old school definition that most people are familiar with has to do with physical nexus. And I, I love the word physical nexus in terms of how what this explanation is, because although everyone knows what the word physical means, the states have different interpretations of what that means already. So the physical nexus in the state typically meant you have an office, like brick and mortar, a warehouse, sometimes remote employees in a particular state. And that's what it has meant in the past. There are permutations of what physical means, as I said, that really change that definition, but that's the old definition and that still exists to this point in time. The newer kind of nexus is economic nexus. And that's where you basically meet a certain level of sales transaction, whether that's gross receipts or number of transactions within a state. And there's absolutely no physical presence required whatsoever. We're gonna get into that a little bit deeper as we continue through this. The other two types of nexus that were kind of physical nexus that states tried to use to impose physical nexus rules on you were basically click-through nexus where the seller met a sales threshold in a state from the activities of an in-state referral agent, right? So that became for the state another kind of physical nexus that they called click-through nexus, it's very specific rules around it. And then also affiliate nexus where the remote retailer holds some kind of substantial interest or is owned by an in-state retailer that also product basically sells the same products in a similar name or the same name, right? So a, affiliate nexus was also kind of added to that overall definition of physical nexus over time. And then the newest nexus as well that has been imposed by many states, and actually I think this is now pretty much universal of all states, and that is marketplace nexus. Um, many of you don't have to worry about that unless you are representative of a marketplace. In other words, like you're, you, you serve your clients much like Amazon serves its clients. But marketplace facilitators are now in almost all states required to collect and remit sales tax on behalf of the individual seller so that the individual seller doesn't have to do that. Okay. What are the kind of activities that can actually create physical nexus? So there's, this is the large, the large list of the kinds of things that can create physical nexus. And as I said, some of them are, don't seem like they're very physical at all, but it's essentially the way that the, this definition has evolved over time. Most of you who, or any of you who have any multi-state locations, those locations represent an additional nexus point. Anyone who does maintenance or service or repairs with human beings essentially going out to those locations, those, those people, those individual resources that go out to those other states can confer physical nexus on you. So you can see the list here of the things that you typically think of having owned or leased property, but hosted data centers has been added to that. Your fields and service staff, 
charging for licenses or royalty or fees has been added to that, right? Direct online sales, obviously. The, the list sort of goes on. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but understand that one of the ones that is really missed by a lot of people, like a lot of the clients that we talk to is that you have investors or board members, executive board members in a particular jurisdiction and people frequently forget about them in terms of a nexus creating activity, but they, they create physical nexus for your firm overall, right? So really difficult to monitor in terms of understanding where it is that you have physical nexus. Add to that the, the whole discussion around economic nexus, and that's all as a result of, and I'm hoping that most people are familiar with this, but I mean, this occurred in 2018, the South Dakota versus Wayfair case where South Dakota won. And what they tried to do is basically they expanded their definition of what a physical presence was by saying that Wayfair had a physical presence by virtue of its economic presence within the state. And then they established rules that, that kind of indicated whether this level of doing business in their state, right, even for, and for all out-of-state sellers, uh, really required them to collect sales taxes. They won in that case. And what that means is that they were able to impose this economic rule, this economic nexus law on out-of-state sellers within the state of South Dakota. And all the other states looked at that and thought, my, that's an excellent idea. We're going to do the same thing. And then this has evolved into the manner in which these rules have basically been generated and, and put into legislation all across the country. A current look at the, the, the way that this nexus, these nexus rules are, are generated or, or basically defined in the different states is in this particular map. So a number of states, that, that economic threshold is typically in well, in most states, is between one hundred thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You can see that most of those states fit into that category. There's a number of states, California and Texas, that that economic nexus threshold is five hundred thousand dollars. And then as well, there are a certain number of states that have, in addition to that, a number of transactions as a rule that would indicate whether or not you have achieved economic nexus. The difficult part about all of this is that this doesn't include all sales in all states, but typically does include basically your, your gross receipts in the state. So it's really careful or really important for you to carefully monitor that and then to understand what those rules are in all those jurisdictions with regard to how you can achieve, I'm going to say, economic nexus in a particular jurisdiction. One of the ways that we assist basically in that manner is we, through the, the provision of information, and this is all as well on our website, and you, you're gonna be getting this, uh, this deck as well, this slide deck as well with regard to that. But essentially here you see all the states that include exempted sales. So they're in the orange color, and that's the majority of the states include your exempt sales. Some of them exclude those, some of them kind of have a split mechanism for where they include some of your exempt sales and some specific services as well, right? And then obviously you still have those individual states that have no, no sales tax whatsoever. So really important to understand this for a really interesting reason. So we have a lot of people that we talk to that are manufacturers. And for example, they'd be selling to resellers and they have never before had to declare nexus in any, in any of these jurisdictions because they're shipping to these jurisdictions, right? They're constantly, the, like they're a remote seller to many of these jurisdictions, but they're, they're selling to resellers. So their thought is, well, I mean, there's no point in me collecting exemption certificates. There's no point in me doing anything or registering. I don't have an obligation to register in only any of those states, but, but they do in many of those states. And what that means is that from their perspective, they should probably be registering in those jurisdictions. Legally, they should be from the from a strict interpretation of the law, they should be. 
But what's really important is that prior to that occurring, they never collected exemption certificates either for those clients in those states. But now, because they're deemed to have nexus in that particular jurisdiction, they're also required to demonstrate why they did not charge sales tax to their clients. That means they do have to have the exemption certificates. And that really changes their business model. It really changes their, their requirements and their duties internally for how they handle their clients. And that's just a, a thing that's largely been forgotten by many businesses. And a lot of businesses also thought that it only included taxable sales. As you can see, that's far from the truth. And a lot of businesses also thought, oh, this is only for e-commerce. But it's not only for e-commerce. It's for anyone that does any form of remote sales whatsoever. Anytime you're shipping to another state. So we've got another quick poll question here. And as I said, we'll continue while you answer that. So what are the five steps essentially to help you manage sales tax compliance? Well, the first one is what we're doing right now is understanding where you need to collect and remit that sales tax. So that's understanding the whole, I'm gonna say profile, sales tax profile of your company, where you have nexus, where you don't have nexus, where you have this requirement essentially. The next step is to register in those particular jurisdictions within which you need to register. And we're gonna have a bit of a discussion about that as well. Then you need to, after you've registered, you need to calculate the correct sales tax amount based on whatever those rules are in that jurisdiction, based on those criteria that we had set out in, in the beginning, where you're selling it to, who you're selling and what you're selling. Then you need to track all of those sales and you also need to track and manage the exempt sales. That's what I was referring to before when essentially when you're not charging sales tax, you're obligated to demonstrate why you did not charge the sales tax. And that means you have to have an exemption certificate for that purpose if you're registered in that particular jurisdiction. And then the last part is the remittance of that particular sales tax to the sales tax authority. Um, and you'd think that it would, you know, it would behoove all states to make that the easiest part, like taking your money. But even that has nuances and is complicated in how that's done in different states. It's done in different ways. Some states accept different kinds of remittances and other states don't. So all of these things are complicated by each individual state having the authority to be able to impose their own individual laws, regulations, rules, et cetera, with respect to how any of these things are done. Knowing where your business has to collect sales taxes, basically understanding that nexus profile that we've been talking about, right? And understanding your business activities and how those can trigger an obligation in a particular sales tax jurisdiction, right? That requires that you stay up to date on the laws that impact those obligations. And occasionally, um, like on a periodic basis, review your business activities to understand what steps you need to take if you do need to register in a new jurisdiction for your business. That registration process can be more complicated than some people think. So when, when we speak with our clients, we typically go through a process of trying to understand this, this particular part in advance. So where it is that you have sales tax obligations. So typically you would know the answer to that where you are currently registered and where you currently have sales tax obligations. But many clients really haven't put um, the thought into this over time that they really think that they have their missing personnel, the, the people that did this part of the, you know, their job in their company are no longer there. All kinds of things can happen where you're starting to not really assess on a constant basis whether or not you should be registering in a new state. So essentially that's a part of a bigger conversation to understand that if you need to register in a particular state and then what's involved from that perspective. So one of the things that we like to, to note to people is that um, we offer a free economic nexus, nexus assessment um, 
and that there's a there's a link within the the system here well within the presentation here as well as directly on our website where you can go to for that particular purpose right the the key thing to note here is that if you're registering in a state where you already have obligations and you've had obligations for some time you might need to make that known because you're you're going to be signing a document that basically says hey i verify that we have not had any kind of obligations prior to this but now we're registering because we believe we have either physical economic that whatever the whatever the obligation has been conferred to you based on right nexus in your particular state so we're going to start to collect and remit if you've had that for some time you might need to go through a process of filing a voluntary disclosure agreement a vda so um and this process is is very specific to those companies that have some amount that they understand that they probably owed in the past and they need to basically true up to the state to to get to that point where they can register without any further penalties etc so this is a this is a very long discussion in terms of whether or not you should be looking at doing a VDA in a new state that you're registering in but essentially it's something that's really necessary to understand so that you don't well well so that you do mitigate the risk that you're putting yourself into by registering on any past exposure that you've got for your for your firm so we we have many partners like that are accounting accounting firms PA firms that are doing this on behalf of their clients on behalf of our clients as well we do this kind of thing as well in terms of services that we offer so it just behooves you to if it is something that looks like it's going to be a requirement to look at it closely and understand whether or not you might need to file a VDA within the jurisdictions that you plan on registering in then the next step obviously is collecting and calculating the correct amount of the sales tax and again because this is on a state by state basis and the rules are different it becomes very complicated so there's over 13,000 tax jurisdictions in the US a lot of people don't really understand that but when you take a look at the intersection of all of the different tax rate jurisdictions that are drawn basically almost by hand in some cases with respect to what the jurisdiction represents there's there's a overwhelming number of tax rate jurisdictions in the US. In 2023, there were over 85,000 updates of those tax rate jurisdictions. And then you can see in terms of just tax holidays, like sales tax holiday rules, there were almost 100,000 of those in 2023. So each one of these jurisdictions has their own set of tax rates, product taxability rules, right? And even within jurisdictions, there can be nuances. The other part of this is that people have typically in the past, and this is what we were all taught when, you know, when we, when we went to school, like the, the sales tax jurisdictions are like they're, they're mapped out by a zip code, right? And nothing could be further from the truth. In the past, that may have been close to true and essentially programmers could emulate some kind of an area on the ground by using zip codes, but they were never the same as the tax rate jurisdictions. And now that's the furthest thing from the truth. So it's, it's really critical to understand which jurisdictions actually apply to your transactions. The other part that's complicated, as all of you probably know, is the understanding of whether your product is taxable or not. This can be really easy for some businesses that are really concentrated on a specific kind of set of goods that they supply. But for companies that do a large number of, of different types of products, it can get very complicated. So, and I mean, an easy one that you see here is the one right in the middle, the toothbrushes and dental floss. So, I mean, because it's kind of medical and kind of not, some places tax it, right? And some places don't in New York fully taxable right in pennsylvania completely exempt so why does this happen 
when you think about it, right? Like what, what made this happen that some of these things are taxable and some of them are not? Well, it has to do with like, does it have sugar in it or not? Is the state trying to encourage businesses that sell these kinds of goods? Are they trying to encourage them to be in business in their state? Are they trying to encourage some kind of behavior with consumers with regard to taxing or not taxing certain kinds of goods? So there's all these considerations that go into this and it makes it super complicated when you cross-reference the 13,000 different tax rate jurisdictions with the over 2,500 mainstream rules that there are for product taxability and cross-reference those into trying to make sense of it when you're actually putting together an invoice for a client or charging at a till for a client for what the, the correct amount is. So this calculation is a, is a complicated thing. The other part that makes it complicated is understanding where to tax it. Again, the standard, I'm gonna say if you're, especially if you're doing business in other states than the state that you're in, it's typical that you're, you're taxing at the ship to, the destination address. In some states, if you are sending from that state, from inside that state to inside that same state, it might be the origin. There's five states that do that, origin-based taxation based on only in-state, so intra-state transactions, right? And there are some instances where you might be using bill to very infrequently though. And again, this is, these are all considerations that technology can assist with and making sure that you are using the, the correct location with regard to how you should be taxing. How you ta track and manage exempt sales is a hugely, and, and has become since Wayfair, and this is something, again, a lot of people just haven't understood, has become a huge issue for firms because they many firms have not had to do it in the past because they haven't had an obligation to do it, right? They didn't have nexus, they didn't have an economic nexus, there was no requirement for them to do it because they didn't have nexus, but now they do. So, and if they don't register in a particular state because they, they think, well, what's the point of registering? Well, it's all exempt sales. If, if an auditor comes, I'm just gonna say, well, I only sell to resellers, to retailers. They're all exempt. What's, what, what's the worst thing that could happen to me? Well, if you don't have the exemption certificates for those clients that you're selling to, you, that you're selling to the worst thing that can happen to you is, is going to be the worst thing because the state's going to confer nexus on you because you have it. And then because you don't have the exempt certificates, you haven't proved why you shouldn't be collecting the sales tax. So they'll want it. So essentially this has become a very, very big issue for many, many jurisdictions, for many companies. And so it's really, really a a strong recommendation that you review this for your company and make sure you have your exemption certificates for those products, for those companies that you're selling into, that you're providing no taxation on their, their invoices too. A lot of people also get confused as to, I have an exemption certificate, it's from six years ago, it's gotta be good. Not necessarily so, it could have expired. Many exemption certificates expire now. Many exemption certificates are sent to you on behalf of a specific company name, but the company name has changed, that has sent it to you, or your corporate name has changed. It's important that all of that information is updated so that it's current all the time, because that's what's gonna be looked at with respect to holding you from harm with regard to those exemption certificates. So you should really review the process that you have for requesting and validating and then storing those exemption certificates because they're what essentially, they, they keep you from harm in the event of an audit. Um, and we have, uh, like we hire individuals that have been auditors in their previous lives. And they basically, I mean, their, their comment on the whole issue around exemption certificates is they view it as money. They view like the, the exemption certificates you have not collected. That's money on the table for them. It's really easy to find. And it's the, the most lucrative part of 
essentially of an audit. We have another question in here in terms of our, our polls. And again, I'll let you get into that as we continue here. Remitting the sales tax to the sales tax authority, I mean, it should be really simple, but it's not. So in the US, I think we have over 800, and I'm trying to remember the exact number, I can't remember the exact number, but it's, it's well over 800 different styles and types of returns. And they all have a remittance period and methodology. Some of them have prepayments that you can make that give you an incentive, like they're basically an incentive for you to gain a discount from the state. Some of them have prepayments you must make. And some of those prepayments are calculated on your behalf. And some of them you can calculate. So there's a, there's a large number of factors and variables involved in just the giving of your remittances to the actual state, right? And then as well of handling any kind of tax notices or late payments or that type of thing. These are all things that are that basically add work and are not easy to, to track because they are different on a per state basis. Like, I mean, just because you know how to do it in the state that you're in does not mean that as you grow into other jurisdictions that it's gonna be the same. It's not gonna be the, it, it's absolutely not gonna be the same process in the jurisdictions that you grow into. And that's something to consider as you, as you do that. So from my perspective, I've always hated the idea of companies having to um, not grow because of administrivia, because of sales tax reasons that keep them from growing because they don't they don't think that they'll be able to handle it, right? So remit your sales tax to the tax authority is, as said, complicated and essentially needs to be reviewed on a frequent basis to make sure that you're doing it correctly on an on-time basis, right? And to make sure that you're doing it where you require, obviously. So from an overall perspective, from our perspective, those five steps to managing the sales tax compliance that we sort of outlined in the beginning, how do we address those corporately and with technology? Like how, what, what can be done about those steps to make them easier for you so that you know what to do to essentially address them correctly? So first of all, we handle the where through Nexus assessments that we can provide for you. And there's there's very detailed ones that are like a professional service that we provide for you that can lead to VDAs and that type of thing. So we do handle those. They can also be handled through your CPA, but it's something that needs to be done, right? So you need to know and understand where you must collect and remit the sales tax. We have products that assist you with regard to registration. So our Avalara licensing products basically are there to help you register in individual jurisdictions or bulk numbers of jurisdictions at a time in a, in a sensible, easy way that makes it simple for you rather than having to you know, look at every state's requirements, pull down the documentation, figure it out, et cetera. The calculation of the sales tax amount is essentially the origination of our overall product, right? Avalara Avatax, which helps you calculate those correct sales tax amounts. Our tax engine basically does that. That's what we, we live and breathe, right? We take a look at all of the information that's on your documentation as it's being created. In other words, your invoices, your orders, your quotes, we see those documents real time. We make a millisecond calculation to provide all of the sales tax information for every document, for every line item, for every basically jurisdiction that you're selling from and to. So it's it's super detailed, super accurate, and that's essentially the, the key part that, that originated the business that we provide as well. Tracking the exemption certificates is a, is a component that was added a number of years ago and we basically provide a, a way or a methodology of not only tracking them, 
but getting them from your clients, understanding which kind you need from your clients, making sure you have the right ones, attaching them to your invoices and archiving them and harboring them in a way that you can get at and report on and produce in terms of an audit immediately and quickly and easily so that you're not spending months tracking down exemption certificates on behalf of an auditor. And then the last part is the whole piece around the remittance and the reporting and providing the returns to the different jurisdictions. It's obviously a part that we do because we create the data that is on your calculation. And so all we need to do is aggregate that data and put it together in a format that we can basically provide to the state inclusive of the remittance, right? So the last part, just in terms of tips, you know, I think we've addressed why, we, why you need to automate it, but essentially to be more accurate from my perspective, to be more efficient, because essentially the automation means that you can do something that's more important to your business than collect sales tax. And I think that, that everyone wants to do that. Everyone wants to help their business make more money um, and just <laughs> like doing it more efficiently and taking it out of your hands is just something that makes more a lot more sense than you becoming an expert at working for the working for the state, right? A lot of times this does impact sales or your customer satisfaction. For any of you that have ever bought anything online where it was you were charged a thousand dollars and you see what the amount is, and then when you click submit, your invoice shows eleven hundred and fifty dollars. You're not a happy person, right? because that company did not accurately tell you what the amount of the sales tax was prior to your actual submission of your, of you, that you want to buy the product, right? So a lot of this has to do with customer satisfaction and, and keeping down, I'm gonna say the arguments that are around the sales tax environment. This has a lot to do with your risk management, obviously, because you don't wanna increase your corporate risk, you wanna decrease it. And all of these things, basically lead you to the, the path of being able to ease business growth, like to be able to, to focus on activities that help you make money. So from our perspective, what do we offer in terms of our tax compliance suite? Well, our front end is, it starts out with our tax research engine. That tax research, pro, we actually have a, a product that is called Avalara Tax Research. That product gives you access to not only the content that generates all of the kinds of results that we provide in our tax calculations. It also gives you access directly to tax researchers so that if you have very, very defined questions regarding your situation, you have access to people who are experts in this environment to provide you with information regarding that, the information that you require. We have a system that completely automates exemption certificate management all the way from requesting it to archiving it, harboring it, and using it for those clients that are exempt in the correct manner on their documents. That includes, obviously, the tax determination. And these are all, basically, these, these components are all part of a suite that work together on your behalf. And then the last part is the sales tax returns. Because we're doing the tax determination, and because that's directly connected, integrated inherently to your, your ERP, your e-commerce, et cetera, whatever systems you have, so that we become a single repository of all of that data and all of that information, we're able to provide your sales tax returns as well. This is a, a bit of, I'm gonna say, just a, a further in-depth look at all of the, the basic services and how they align that Avalara provides. And as well, the last part is just with respect to the kinds of managed services that we provide as well. So our core products have to do with exemption certificate management, tax calculation, the tax returns and reporting, and something that we haven't talked about, which is e-invoicing and live reporting but this is something you are going to start to hear a lot more about. And e-invoicing has not has got nothing, nothing to do with, with sending your invoice by email. It has to do with new rules that 
countries that are typically charging that value added tax are are I'm going to say suffering from in which they are required to do that invoicing through a state agency and provide live reporting as well at the same time. This is something that's coming to a lot of countries. It's already in a number of com countries in the European Union and basically countries really like this because it stops the leakage of their VAT and so states are reviewing this as well in the US and I think you're going to probably hear more about that as time goes on. We have supporting products for all of those possibilities inclusive of the licenses and the registration, the tax research. We handle item classification for those of you who are doing cross-border or international business. So in other words the HST codes that you might need we also handle 1099s and something that we haven't talked about, property tax. We have integrations to accounting systems and ERP systems, CRM systems, e-commerce systems, marketplaces directly, point of sale systems directly, billing and payment systems. And if we don't have an integration to those, we have a, a, a super, super sophisticated and well thought out API set, the application program interfaces that are available as well for custom kinds of integrations. And then as well, we provide professional services across the spectrum for all of those products and for our clients in terms of reviewing their particular requirements. Last slide with regard to your pop-up question. And we're also just gonna cover one last point that a lot of people have not heard about, and that just has to do with what, what is known as SST, the Streamlined, Streamlined Sales Tax Initiative. Hard to say. So <laughs> what that is, is a, a program that's been put together by 24 states in which if you qualify, which means normally right now that you only have economic nexus in, but in other words, that you, you, you qualify through a number of different things and we can, we can go through this on a one-on-one -on -one call with you to establish whether or not you qualify. But what it gives you is the ability for us to provide free registrations, free tax calculations, free returns preparation and filing, right? free audit assistance and response. It provides uniform definitions and rules across all of those jurisdictions and one registration and an ID number to basically provide remittances in all those jurisdictions as well. So it's a it's a great program if you qualify for it for many customers to mitigate the cost of sales tax compliance through our service or through anyone else who is a basically a certified service provider to that particular program. And that takes us to questions. Wow, that was a that was a whole lot jam packed into the last 48 minutes. Thank you, Ronnie, for going over that. I just wanted to go over just a couple of reminders for folks. We had a lot of questions asking if we did record this. Yes, we did record this. We are still recording this. So everyone will uh, receive a link to that within the next 24 hours. We have gotten so many great questions. So I appreciate everyone for being engaged and we'll do our best. We have uh, about 10 minutes, so we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Going back to what you were talking about with the five steps, you mentioned sales tax holidays, and I think that that's a new term for some folks that are on here. Can you address tax holidays in a little bit more detail if you can? Sure. I mean, what we what we normally know as sales tax holidays that everyone can really relate to, I think, is when we talk about buying school supplies for your kids, right? Because many states say that, okay, great, the latter part of August when you're buying all the school supplies for your kids, school supplies have a tax holiday. There's a essentially a holiday time period. There's 15 days, 20 days or whatever, during which time when you buy those things, there's no sales tax charged on those particular products. That's what a sales tax holiday essentially is. And that, that concept has grown from not only schools, but it has grown as a result, I'm gonna say of, large scale natural catastrophes. So a lot of states now start to offer sales tax holidays on building goods or guys uh, that are needed after you know rebuilding from a hurricane 
or tornadoes or that type of thing. And um, so they're a lot more frequent now and states are using them strategically to help business in certain segments at certain times of the year to basically sell sales tax free. Thank you. Um, and then I did, I wanted to give a couple of shout outs for a couple of pieces of related resources that we have available to you on the console. One of them is Avalara Tax Changes 2024. That goes into a ton of detail. It's 163 pages, but we talk about sales tax holidays in addition to a lot of other trends and changes that we're seeing across sales tax. Um, so if you're interested in seeing the latest on what states or even jurisdictions are doing, I would definitely recommend you go to our website on that and check that out. There, we also have uh, resources on economic nexus laws by state. We have links to the streamlined sales tax that Ronnie just talked about. We've had a few questions related to uh, drop shipping, which is something that is very complicated. It has a lot of detail that depends. It's very specific to the scenario. So I also wanted to let folks know that I've added a new resource. You might need to refresh your screen or it will be available to you uh, in the link that we send out for on demand. Um, but we have a little infographic and a white paper that goes into more uh, depth on drop shipping. So if you're interested in that, I just wanted to let folks know that that will be available to you on demand as well. Um, let's talk a little about uh, remote employees. I saw some folks had questions on, is that a pretty nationwide rule where if you have a remote employee in a state, you automatically have nexus there? Or do the rules vary by state with that one? It Unfortunately, they still do vary by state, but they're slowly changing to be a little bit more consistent. In the past, um, you needed to have a sales resource, someone that was customer facing in a particular jurisdiction for them to consider that person to give you nexus in that, in that, in that state. But uh, it has become, especially on an, in, in our environment, sales tax, like sale, you know, uh, in a, what we do, you know, software as a service um, and any kind of software companies, they provide so much direct client service remotely that they've started to reinterpret some of these rules so that essentially almost anyone working on your behalf in another jurisdiction starts to confer Nexus on you. And this really accelerated during COVID. So because what, what COVID did is that the states all sort of said, well, okay, we're gonna lay off on those rules because we know everyone's working from, from home, especially in those states where people might cross the border, like they, they, they live in a different state than what they work in. And it was done easily. It was kind of not really addressed during COVID. And then after COVID now, those rules are becoming much more strict again because clients, or well, the clients, the states are seeing that essentially when you're not returning back to their office, which is where you did have Nexus, you're actually working from someplace else where you really should have Nexus from their perspective. So it, ha it has grown to be almost all individuals in those jurisdictions, in those states. Got it, okay. I had another question that I saw related to 1099s in this remote sellers. Does it have anything to do with the 1099s that you're sending out when considering it a can remote? Have. It, it can have, absolutely, yeah. Because they're considered to be, I mean, either essentially an affiliate, right, or a yep. reseller in some manner or form, or they get employee status conferred on them by the services they're providing for you. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, another one to do with physical presence nexus. You mentioned trade shows as one of the things that can trigger physical nexus pre presence. And this person says everyone attends the trade shows. Can you explain a little bit more how that relates to nexus? It's less of the attendance to the trade show and more of the participation in the trade show. So for example, when, I mean, for us, when we have a booth at a trade show and we're in well, Vegas, I mean, everyone everyone goes to Vegas for, for trade shows, but when you have a booth there and you're set up there, that can, can confer Nexus on you. So California is the, is the state that had, that started all of the rules and regulations with respect to that. And I can't remember the exact number of days, but if you participated as a vendor, as a, as a participant, like in a displaying 
goods, services, whatever, in a booth for three or four days um, within the state, that automatically conferred nexus on you. So other states have seen that as well. And essentially, they look at it like you're selling in that particular jurisdiction. To note, it is possible. So many clients have like these events, large scale events that they go and they sell at. They sell their t-shirts at these events and this type of thing. And then they're, they're gone for the rest of the year. You can, in many instances, get like a short term registration for an event based on that. But that's very specific to the state allowing that particular behavior and the kind of thing that you're participating in. So that can happen, that can work, but you need to check directly with that particular jurisdiction, that state for that to work. Okay, noted. All right, let's move on into questions around economic nexus. I think that we have a lot of folks on here who may be newer or not as familiar with that. We had a lot of questions related to the thresholds and whether those were applicable by, um, is it by month, is it by year? What does that look like when it comes to the thresholds? So it's typically by year. So, but the, the answer to that is unfortunately it depends which state, right? Because every state has their own, what they call evaluation period. And that evaluation period essentially just is different. So for some states, it's this calendar year. For some states, it's the previous calendar year. For some states, it's both. For some states, it's trailing 18 month sales, trailing 12 month sales trailing quarters, like calendar quarters sales. So uh, essentially we provide in the service that we provide the evaluation of your economic nexus versus the rules in the manner in which the state has prescribed the rules. In other words, their evaluation period, their numbers, their, right, they're, they're essentially their rules so that you know whether you're on or offside, but it is different from every state's perspective. Okay. And another call out for an additional or related resource we have on the console, there is something called state by state guides to economic nexus. And that has the information that Ronnie is referring to as to what each states, not only what they include in their threshold, the type of transactions, but it will also tell you what the um, threshold dates are, whether it's the past 18 months, past calendar year, whatever it is. So definitely check that out. Bookmark it. We refresh that on a regular basis. So that's a great resource for you all. Another one related to economic nexus, does a company have to collect sales tax from a customer even if they are below the threshold? Well, if, they're, if they've met the threshold and they register, they obviously have to collect the sales tax. If, they, if they're still below the threshold, no, they don't have to collect sales tax from any of their clients in that state. Okay. And then on the flip side, what happens when a business reaches the threshold one year, so they have to register and start collecting in that state, and then the following years, maybe they fall below the threshold. Is there a way to cancel registration or what do the, res the responsibilities look like in that case? There are ways of canceling registrations, but they're as varied as the states are, again, in terms of an answer. And unfortunately, I mean, just the reality that I see in general is that it's very easy to gain nexus and it's really really hard to cancel it to to remove it so um and that's why it's a it's a it's an important consideration as to when you do it and and if you do it right because it's so hard to get rid of yeah okay all right well let's see if we can fit one more questions in here let's look at exemption certificate management. I saw a couple of questions. I know you mentioned that exemption certificates obviously vary a lot by state. Is there a specific kind of rule of thumb as best practice for how often you should be uploading or updating those? Well, there is in, in terms of if they have an expiry date, absolutely. If you want to do it before the expiry date. Um, but if you if you don't have an expiry date on the documents that you're dealing with, uh, typically, like we see our clients doing that from a one to three year cycle, and it really depends on the nature of your business. But essentially what they're doing is they're making sure that the, the you know, the 80-20 the rule that they're selling, their, selling you know, those, those clients that they're selling the preponderance of their goods to, that they're keeping up with those documents. 
And there is a way from our systematic, from our system, like to systematically, to automatically get all of the renewed exemption certificates or new exemption certificates at whatever time period you deem is important for your business. Yeah. All right, fantastic. Well, we are right at the top of the hour. So Ronnie, seriously, thank you so much for jam packing everything that you did into this, uh, this past hour. This was really valuable. Um, for all of our attendees, just a couple of final reminders. Like I said, we did record this, so you will receive a link to the recording in the next 24 hours. We'll share that with you in your email inboxes. If you qualified for CPE, don't forget that your certificate is available to download in the console. And then you'll also have access to this console in the link that we send you for on demand. Um, so you will have access to your certificate both in the email and you can access it in this console as well. Don't forget to check out those additional resources. If there are any that pique your interest, go ahead and click on those now. They'll open up in a new tab and you can take a look at them once the webinar is over. Um, I do want to, like I said, a lot of those resources are updated on a regular basis, so they can be a great ones to bookmark um, and just keep stay tuned for the latest on what's going on with economic nexus or just in general sales tax rates and rules. So thank you everyone for staying with us for the last hour. We really appreciate your engagement with this topic and we will be back with you soon for one of our future webinars. Thanks so much, everyone.